Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jeff Wilson here with Dez W. Woodruff. Uh, and if you don't know who Dez is, Dez is of Valor Bare Knuckle. He is a founding ma uh, manager, uh, member, founding member of Bout Management LLC, the co founder of Business Growth Celebrity Academy, the business partner of Ken Shamrock, and the president and founder of Grok Trade. And I'm super excited to have you on the show today, Des. Uh, I know you just came back from fight, fights last night. How are you and how were the fights? <laughs> I'm doing fine, and Jeff, thanks for having me on the show. The fights were fantastic. The co-main event were two killer guys coming in who were kickboxers, and I saw a roundhouse and knocked the other guy out right in front of me. I was cage side, and it's crazy. It was a fun night at Shamrock FC. <laughs> yeah. How many events have you guys had with Shamrock FC? Well, Shamrock FC – is a lot of people think that that's a Ken Shamrock uh, uh, place. It's not. It's owned by Jesse Finney out of St. Louis, and they've had 230 events there. Oh, not cool. Yeah, so we might be working with them a little bit going into the future. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, anybody that gets through 230 events, it's right up there. What are you at, UFC, 244, 43, something? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, there um, you have UFC, you have Bellator, and then you have Shamrock FC. They're third. They're they're big dogs. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, awesome. Well, uh, what I got really excited about, I want to talk to you about literally your past and how you met Ken Shamrock and how you how you sort of set up business with him. I, I really want to get into the business of uh, bare knuckle because that is a growth area, and I think that you're a guy that understands opportunity and growth. But um, before we get too much into that, talk to me about uh, your past. Where, like baby Des Woodruff, where'd you, where'd, you, where'd you grow up? Where'd you come from? How'd you get into this entrepreneur-like fight type uh, things? Tell me a little bit about your parents and where you started. <clears throat> well, my parents were hippies, pot-smoking <laughs> hippies. <laughs> and... But I uh, grew up uh, poor, man. Uh, here in the United States, we had something called food stamps. So we had food stamps. I got the free lunches at school. And I was angry as a kid. I was a fighter. I was a scrapper. And uh, grew up that way. Grew up that way. And uh, I lived in a mobile home. <laughs> I had my, didn't have phone sometime. They would get shut off. We're talking the old school phone, right? The one with the cord in, at the house. So uh, that's how I grew up, but I was always an entrepreneur. I grew up, man, I was hustling. I would, in the summertime, I'd go and scour the creeks for golf balls at the golf range, or you know, at the golf course, and on at the bridges where the golfers would go by, I would sell golf balls to the guys. Oh, and, and then I sold. Uh, I used to sell candy at school. Then I became a bookie. I was a bookie in sixth grade. And I got <laughs> got busted for that. <laughs> and but. <laughs> And then in, in the winter time, I'd shovel walks or, or uh, we'd go Christmas caroling. We found out that Christmas caroling was easier and that we'd get paid more money sometimes. Well, so <laughs> so, they tip you for your song. So you have a right. great voice too or you just call no, it? No, no. You, you know, Jeff, I took a DNA test from 23andMe and it, and it has all these things. Likely you have blue eyes. Likely you won't have a hairy back. Likely you won't be bald. And they hit on all those things, right? But it said, likely you won't be able to carry a tune. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> that's true. I swear. I swear. Oh, uh, uh, that's funny, man. So, uh, so always hustling, trying to get eats, and that's just the way you are, man. And 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 uh, that's great. What what state were you? In Indiana. Indiana. I, I lived in a couple. Of, I was in South Carolina. I have a lot of family in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. So I'm half Cajun. So I've got that side in me too. Sweet, uh, tough guy, scrapper, hustler. Um, and man, I, I love the Grok trade stuff. Like, I was looking at it, I'm like, that's uh, a technical analysis works. Like, that's just the thing that I do as well. Um, how did you get into, the, into trading the market and creating uh, that company? Well, I it was funny because I had some people that I was friends with, they and they were just killing it in the markets and doing really well. And I thought, man, you know, and I'm in my twenties and I'm like, I'm, and I understood that 
concept of wanting to diversify income streams. And I really become cognizant of the fact that trading is probably the best business model out there. Because if you think about it, I look at every dollar like an employee. My employees have to be making me money, not losing me money. And 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 I could be in the market, have risk, or out of the market at any time. And if the markets crash, I can make money when it goes down too. There's no better business model than that. You know, I can't get into real estate and have that sort of flexibility and freedom to navigate those different uh, waters that come through, or or the the upfront cost for franchises and also yeah, man. like bar barriers to entry. You're like, you know what? If you can work hard and you can take your first couple of years of getting beat up because that's just the process of becoming a pro trader yeah. everybody has that story you get beat up for a while and then you get good um but yeah it, you're exactly right that's uh it, 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 it it's it's almost like if you get it and you work hard um and you and you have the right people around and the right techniques uh the barrier entry is not there anybody can become wealthy yeah, anybody can. Well, what I did was I came in, I blew my first two accounts. They were gone. I, I started the market and it was gone. And I thought, man, I'll save up some more money and did it again. And it took me a while and it finally disappeared. And I thought, wow. But if you talk to me, I'm telling you, Jeff, and then you and I were sitting across having coffee. He's like, this cat knows what he's talking about. Man. He knows trading. And I did, but I was missing something. Well, there was a guy that uh, he's he's not alive anymore, but he's in my trading club. I started this small trading club with four people. It's over 500 now. It's huge. It's crazy big for stock traders. And but Al, his name is Al, and he and he was a fundamental trader. He was all about the numbers and the strength of the business and finding those companies that were set to explode. And I was more a technician, so I waved the flan uh, the uh, the flag of you know, the technical analysis and he was waving the flag of fundamental analysis. And one day in the true story, man, we come together and we said, Des, he came to me and he goes, use my stocks to, to go bullish technically on and, and let's just see what happened. So he taught me fundamental analysis and I started doing the technical analysis on top of it. And that's when everything changed. That's mm. when every, and for me, it took an, a, a mentor, like a coach, Mm -hmm. to have to drive that because even though I understood it, I needed that coach for discipline. <laughs> so when I got the mentoring, that's what did it for me. And and then Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I hired me. I was with them forever. I helped them do curriculum stuff. And, and I yeah, love that. Love that, guys. And that's great stories. Like, just awesome. Yeah. Cool. So so you move and, and you start creating your trading things and things start to work. How do you – how do you get to uh, connecting with Ken? Yeah, that's funny. Well, you know, I it was funny. I go back a step with the the trading. So I'm I'm doing this trading, and I just had a knack for it. It was funny because I, don't, you know, we meant we mentor a lot of people at Rock Trade. We have a lot of people come through. Not all of them are successful. Others are. And I found out it was these two things, man. These two things. If if a person can be one highly disciplined and two emotionally cold blooded, meaning that when they're in the markets, it's ones and zeros, you know, black and white, and where they're not fear and greed doesn't drive them. Yeah. If if they if those if if they can be cold blooded in the markets and they can be disciplined, they can do amazing things. And and my website went number one on Google because I I started doing trading. Um, trading videos they got really big in the UK really big back in 2004 and I thought man I'm gonna bring this to the US and when I did I got my website and it went number one on Google and so now I've got this education company and I'll drive have you read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad by chance I have okay cool well you know the quadrants right mm -hmm. my problem and this drives where I am with Ken Shamrock my problem was this. I was self-employed. I created this business. I have this education company. I'm trading. So I trade, but I also teach. But now I've got other people working for me. And we're going down the path. But everybody wants me because they watch my videos. Yep. I'm the famous one in their eyes, right? I have followers from 162 countries that watch my videos. If they can speak broken English, they're watching. <laughs> so I'm, I've got these videos out there, they're, but they're wanting me. The problem is I'm only, I, I only eat what I kill, right? And I'm locked in a, in a I'm, I'm now in this box of self-employed. I'm not a business owner. And I got thinking, I, 
I was working with Rich Dad Poor Dad. I taught this stuff and I'm self-employed. So then I purposely went out and found somebody to take my spot in um, as the thoroughbred, the, the workhorse that I feature this individual. Now his name's Mark. And it took me a couple of years to where people started trusting him. Now we're five years in to it and everybody wants him. I'm out of it. Well, that allowed me when I pushed him out there and I said, you know what? I want the business to run itself. I'll manage it. But so I can do other fun things. And Ken Shamrock, lo and behold, the world's most dangerous man, a four time heavyweight world champion, the baddest dude on earth uh, and a WWE legend. He shows up at my church, man, to talk. And I said, you just can't make this up. And I said, I'll drive this cat around, you know. And so I volunteered. I said, I will drive Ken Shamrock around from the hotel to wherever he needs to be. The airport, I'll pick him up. You guys don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of that. They're like, okay, great. You take care of that. And I, I, I volunteered myself to be in a position to be near greatness, right? What, what year was this? Uh, that was five years ago. So five years ago, it'd be 2013, 2013 is when it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 2013, 2014. And uh, yeah, and then uh, and then of course the guys he was building, you know, he really built in um, some really good fighters, guys like Jerry Bolander and um, and Pete, just so many of those guys. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. I was a huge fan of Frank too, Frank Shamrock, and and so I'd always watch that. But he was one of the few people that was able. And Din Thomas and I talked a lot about this. The most nervous thing that he gets is fighters that um, aren't able to bridge the gap into new businesses and into new careers, and they spiral down if they can't find that thing. And Ken has always been a guy with – he was always have good people around him, but always a guy who's been able to find the next thing, right? Yeah, well, it's funny. When we found each other, what was interesting – see, I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. And all we need as entrepreneurs are, are opportunities, right? We need opportunities. Give us an opportunity and we'll flourish. We'll do amazing things. And sometimes entrepreneurs don't have those opportunities, so they try to make those opportunities. And But if they're with the right people, with the right financing, they would do magic. Well, I'm with Ken, and I so I'm, we're driving down the road, right? And I'm asking him questions. You know, what do you do now to uh, – to now that you're you know mostly retired what do you do now to monetize your fan base what do you do to bring in income how do you diversify income streams you know i'm asking him all these things and you're not really my driver are you <laughs> <laughs> so i'm just inquisitive as a businessman you know because i want to get behind the scenes. i want to see what's going on and how it works i'm just inquisitive and all he said was this he was looking out the window not at me he's just looking out the window and he goes i need a guy like you and, and I didn't know what that meant at the time. All I know is he, Ken Shamrock says he needs a guy like me. That's super cool, right? So I'm geeking out over it. Two months later, he contacts me and says, can you help me with a website? I said, man, I'll put you up one right now. Yeah, just consider it done. And he didn't have a website. He didn't have social media. One thing leads to another, and I'm helping him get all this stuff structured. I don't know it at the time, but he has two agents. And... And I'm kind of moving in. And finally, he, te- he says, Des, you're going to be my man. The agents have to go to you now. You vet the opportunities to see if it's good for us or not. <laughs> so we become business partners. The agents didn't like that, right? <laughs> they, they wanted to talk right with Ken. But and then Ken and I started working together. And this is what we found out. And you hit it. Because what happens, um, studies show, Jeff, that if you win the lottery five, in five years, you're going to be broke, financially broke again. Yeah. Well, the same thing happens with uh, star athletes, c- celebrities, musicians, magicians, <laughs> with any sort of actors and actresses. Once they retire, and what happens when, when they rise to stardom, so does their money, so does their money, so does their money, and their lifestyle. So their lifestyle is here. When the, when the cameras shut off, when they retire, lifestyle stays, but the money dries up. And it's about a five-year attrition, just like 
someone that wins the lottery and all of a sudden they're in financial hardships, they're in depression, they're doing substance abuse, they're where you're seeing suicide. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Ken and I found, and we found it on accident, and you can see here, you can see my passion about it, but we found it on accident that it takes for someone who retires, if you hook up with a celebrity, like a true celebrity, an entrepreneur with a true celebrity, there's power there. And I'll share it with you, man. We've brought in an additional $6 million that we wouldn't have had otherwise in the last five years working together if he and I weren't working together. I couldn't have done it without him. He couldn't have done it without me. And we, because, and it's not, it's not because I'm anybody, anybody special, Ken's special in his world, right? It's because the entrepreneur, we just need opportunity. The, the celebrity has op, um, opportunity. They don't know how to wield that sword. Yeah. You put an entrepreneur in there, magic happens. Because of that, we started a company called CE3. C for celebrity, E for entrepreneur, and three, meaning there's a third private person that helps make it all happen, CE3.co. And that puts celebrities and entrepreneurs together because we think that that is the secret sauce for celebrities um, after the, they're retired. Oh my God, you might want to break this down. Like I'm sitting here going, absolutely. And the greatest fear of any celebrity is starting that spiral down, but it happens to everyone if they don't yes. reinvent themselves. Or, or develop skills outside of their company. Right, right. So just like you would break down a checklist, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. I apologize. You break <laughs> down a checklist and technically to determine what you're going to invest in the stock. What, how, how were you able to determine what opportunities were great for Ken and mm -hmm. what opportunities weren't? Uh, oh. is, that, is that a fair question? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's fine. That's uh, really fair. Um, and there's two levels I can go with that. So for me, what was great is celebrities always, their phone always tends to ring, right? People are always reaching out with their things. And one thing that I'm, I'm really good at is sniffing out what's legit and what's not. But I always pull in the thread. If someone's got an opportunity, I always go down the path a little bit. I always want to listen. I never want to turn something down. Ken, and it blows my mind. This is a true story. Ken was approached by Starbucks when no one knew that there were Starbucks. He was at the height of stardom. And they were wanting him to invest in their company. And he goes, who would buy coffee? And <laughs> walked away from it. Yeah. If I was in the pocket at that time, we would be owners, part owners of Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> but to answer your question is this. I All opportunities are fair game. And we get down the path. But the ones that we're really looking for are those that have a a, a, a a, a person, a guy or a gal at the helm who I think is an entrepreneur because every great business out there is a true entrepreneur. Those entrepreneur, An entrepreneur is someone that can have a vision and understand opportunity when it's out there, when no one else can see that opportunity and they can make it tangible. That So that's my definition of a, an entrepreneur. So that entrepreneur, if, if they – if, if you're a true, true entrepreneur and you're in a business and you approach us, then that makes sense to us because I need somebody at the helm that's willing to, that doesn't need micromanage and is willing to die trying. If they have those two traits and those are very important to me and they're a true entrepreneur, then it, hey man, let's, let's take Ken's star power. Let's put that together and let's make magic happen. So did I yeah. answer your question? No, I love it. I mean, I mean, you didn't break it down into the checklist, but those, those <laughs> okay, things. I'll help you. <clears throat> but the checklist, the checklist is this: I'm looking for um, first because management, like when I invest in in companies, I'm looking for companies in the stock market who has great management. So I have to have great people. The product itself. We're, we're careful on what we select because any product that we align ourselves with uh, is helps or it, 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 it adds to the brand somehow with Ken. So we have to keep what, what people we associate with uh, yeah. that makes sense for the brand. But I'm looking for something that has traction and uh, um, viability going into the future. And what that means is there's some traction or there's some wins already that it shows that we have traction, that there is a viable opportunity to make money with it. The, the ones that are pure concept and conceptual ideas coming to us, if we're, if we're at a slow season, I might go down the path with them a little bit like we did these. Uh, it doesn't matter. We, but 
for the most part, uh, we can't waste our time on that. We look for those opportunities that they're one making money already. They just need to scale and they're looking for star power to help fan that flame that they've already started. Yeah. You, when you, uh, my assumption would be when you have somebody like Ken there, uh, you've only got a limited amount of time, a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of risk that you wanted to take. So the, you can't test a lot of stuff. You kind of like, well, we'll go down a little bit and we'll do one test. And then you'll be able to determine. Otherwise, you kind of be got to be a visionary, which it sounds like you are. When I'm looking at Valor, uh, Bare Knuckles, and I'm like, oh, what is Des and Ken going to do here? <laughs> um, so, so I'm like, because because now we get into the next questions. Like this is this is something that's already being done, um, and I don't know if it's being done to the best that it could be, but uh, it's it's brand new growth. It's giving a lot of fighters more opportunities to to make money and they're getting viewership that's uh outplaying some of the other pay-per-views out there that are more popular so it's always like what's going on so yeah when i saw your associated press release i was like oh boy so uh let's let's keep a look <laughs> dude when you anytime the ap features you they didn't feature anybody else they featured us yeah and that's legit. That, that helps validate who we are and and what we're doing and the team. Money that, guys pay attention, man. They when do. That, happens. that is the bit. Like I was like, wait a second. Nobody else got that attention. Yeah. No, man. I'll tell you. New York Times caught the story. Washington Post caught the story. Fox caught the story. Uh, Yahoo Sports. Everyone grabbed that story. It was an amazing um, splash that we made coming into the marketplace. But the visionary part, I was the first to come to market for uh, for for automotive sales. Nobody was trading or selling cars on the internet before I came on. Nobody was doing it. The venture capitalists wanted 60% of my business. I said, you guys are greedy. No. See. Worst mistake I ever made in my life. I needed the I needed to be funded. And then I was the first in the world to start doing daily trading videos. And those mm -hmm. got really popular in the UK, right? And then I brought it to the US. So I have these two big things that I was visionaries for that I was I led those charges at the beginning. And five years ago, I was talking with Ken. I said, mark my words. I see the early indications. I see the indicators that the market is hungry for a new sport and it it will be bare knuckle. And he goes, Des, I, be, I, I'm, I believe in that too, 110%. So from that time, Shamrock and I have been talking about it and building up how we're going to do this. And we, but we weren't going to try, we weren't going to exert the time, energy, and effort that it was going to take to, to try to open up the, the market. Yeah, so yeah. As soon as Wyoming opened up, I said, go time. So we, we put together a, a team of killers, man. So we have over 85 plus years of uh, combined combat sports experience. And uh, we have UFC's former PR director. She's with us. We have, dude, I mean, we have star power with Ken. We signed with Studio City as for a TV show, for a, a reality show to Amazing. find the best bare knuckle fighters all over the nation. And we're gonna drive them into our show. But we think bare knuckle is the next combat sport that will go mainstream. And all I ask, and you can see, my, uh, all I'm asking all the news people, you have boxing and then you have MMA tabs on the website. Yeah. We need to have a bare knuckle tab. Yeah. All, that's what we want. We want the bare knuckle tab. And so we're it, out there it, doing it, our it, thing. And the other ones, you actually have to have it. So if you, if uh, any media guys are out there listening, I don't confuse your fans, make the category. You got um, to make and, the category. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it does make sense. It's fun to watch. And for the diehard boxers out there that have always – kind of wanted to come back to fight and, and you have some aging superstars in Mayweather and uh, Manny Pacquiao and some guys that are upcoming in boxing. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's the sound, but it makes me smile. Sometimes when you hear <laughs> that you're just yeah. like, oh, oh, gee, oh, like it kind of puts you on the edge of your seat more than with the gloves and, and yeah. even with MMA stuff, like it just seems more, I don't know, more emotional, you know what I mean? <laughs> does it's it's you know because you're using god's given gifts right here you're not adding tools you're not adding gloves it's something amazing yeah. about it i i think that well the studies show that every 25 to 30 years combat sports makes this major change and ufc sold you know in 2016 
for a lot of money, but their their viewership started dropping in 2011. I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a data guy. I look at metrics and stuff. In 2011, they started dropping. They sold in 2016. In other words, it took them five years to sell their business for 4.2 billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I think that the market is hungry, just like you. You love the sound of it, right? The yeah. pop. And what I like about it is it's it's edgy and it's something new that the market can take and um, and, and and that it just it makes sense, right? Because you know I look at traditional boxing as our grandpa's sport. I look at MMA like our dad's sport, and I want the Generation Y and Generation Z to say bare knuckle. That's our sport. And and I think if 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 the YZ ears take on and they're like, man, if they dig this bare knuckle stuff uh, this sport will have longevity and it will be the next big thing we just hope that we're the brand that can take it well into the future i think you guys have a great chance and i think that the, with your management and your star power behind you we'll start to see it this does seem to be the era of conflict entertainment <laughs> and what i mean by that is the conor mcgregor floyd mayweather stuff mm. like it's a bit contrived. Having said that, I still watch it. And so I always kind of take a look at, you know, what's going on. We look at Askren and Masvidal. That's real. You can just tell uh, when the conflict happens. And, uh, and um, to me, I think it's very dangerous to put that out there um, uh, and not – take it seriously you can't really create conflict in a place where it doesn't exist tj delishaw henry cejudo they brought out snakes did you see that thing where he he pretended to give him jake the snake and he hit the and the crowd was like well, are you kidding me like that's a terrible you guys would never do that it's just crazy to see that but yet at some level we're getting to a level where man you know what if there's real conflict Mm. and there's real stuff there um it sells <laughs> yeah it sells and i'm kind of like nervous because because in, in in this situation i love ken from way back but i see like mark coleman hey i'd fight ken again and you're kind of mm. like oh um do you you know where where do we see the next big fight in bare knuckles without giving too much away because i know you can't tell me the stuff in the back, but, you know like where do you see the real authentic bare knuckles coming from is it building up you know the ultimate fighter style bare knuckle ufc reality tv show is it doing that like what like what is going to generate that and make sure that it works do you think Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and Ken, when you interview him, he'll he'll be able to speak on that to, at some for some time. Uh, I I think what we what is think about this for a second. Think about the, those individuals who did rise to stardom. They're the best of the best, the champions, and then they come to the peak, the pinnacle, right, the apex, and then they start to drop. They're still top dogs, fighters, but they're not winning at that elite level anymore. And they tend to peel off very, very quickly. They could still contend with you know, 70% of the rest of the fighters, but because they have some losses, they're trying to preserve, they're trying to preserve their their legacy, right? And they retire and they're out. And they may not be able to compete in boxing or an MMA at that elite level, but it doesn't mean they can't still compete. It's in their DNA, right? They have an opportunity with bare knuckle and, and people want to say it's more dangerous. And I would, my contention is, no way. yeah, no it's way. no way because you, because you understand it, but yeah, the yeah, rest yeah. Of the world, your head, but no. not your brain. That's, that's the thing that I like about it. See, I, I'm so glad you said that. Very few people understand this. You know, we can use this example, and I think it's brilliant. Hang a chain from the ceiling, put a bowling ball on it, put on your 16-ounce gloves, and you can pound that thing all night long. You take those gloves off, and you're not going to be – you're not going to hit it nearly as hard. Same way. Same way. And in MMA, you got elbows and knees. In bare knuckle, you just have the knuckles. 
Yeah. It's it's a safer sport. That's all. It's a safer I, sport. I think uh, it's a good thing you said. Having said it, throwing the punch. I think that not a criticism to it, but I think that you have to, you have to drink more milk, man. <laughs> you got to get your calcium to make sure your hands don't break or they have yeah. to be broken and healed over. But uh, you don't get the C the CDT or the CTs like you see in football and other fighters go down. They just it's just not a thing. You don't have that space in the glove. That shakes your head and rattles a bit. I think boxing and MMA are way worse for it. I think bare knuckles. I mean, it's, you got to be a different kind of person to do it anyway. <laughs> but like, you're, you, I don't think your nose might get a little crooked, but that's you know, you're not gonna uh, get to the same level of damage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With that. And I think that that I've when I was commentating, I had a, a a really good talented wrestler, Matt Fedler, that said in my his whole life was all about MMA, and he did one. One um, ju uh, one MMA fight at commentator is amazing. He was getting beat up, armbarred the guy, crazy win, and he stopped fighting from that moment on. He's like 20, went into politics. He's like 23 or 4 at that time. I said, why? And he said, because I, I don't want to mess my brain up. Mm. I don't want to be the one of those guys. And now I think as much as people don't believe maybe that it's there yet, it's true. Bare knuckles is actually, it looks bad. You get cuts. Right. Superficial yeah. trauma. That's all that is. Yeah. I mean, that's just like going out on a Friday night when you're, you know, <laughs> that's just so, that's, no, it's, but it's kind of like, you know, that's if you want to think long-term um, and I love the thing that you talked about how they're, they're punching too. I never really thought about that. You want to be more efficient. You want to hit the targets, right? right. Behind the ear, here, here. Oh, so and, and you don't want to, you're not going to just continue to jab, set up the jab. Maybe you are, if you, but it's more of a fake and a feint, right? Yeah. So precision. Uh, That's the art of striking. You're going to see a level of precision that has never been witnessed before. I love it. Um, seven months in. What's uh, the best part about it so far, and what is the thing that's making you not sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> As CEO, uh, man, I know, I know you guys. You sit there <laughs> like yeah, I. Yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> good. Uh, the most exciting part is we're at the at the beginning of an emerging market, and you can't, you just can't. You, money can't buy that. You're at the beginning of something new. The excitement of that, having the startup, having the, I mean, everyone's interested. I, everybody is coming to, uh, if you, if I could, if I could drop some names, it would just, you'd be like, you gotta be kidding me. Everyone's showing an interest. And I think it's because of Ken Shamrock bringing validity to it saying, oh, this must have some, some merit, you know, and we might be going forward here. So that that's the my the favorite part of this. I feel like we have a great team. We're going in the right direction to do this. Now, what keeps what keeps me up at night? What keeps me up at night? Um, it was two uh, two major things. Um, one before the funding, because without funding, it's a great idea. But if you do not have the money that great idea is just not going to go anywhere. No one's going to know about it and it's just, it's, it's going to fail. And, and competitions on your heels. There, people are coming <laughs> yeah. after it, right? They They're are. Guys. They are. Man. Because wherever there's money, competition comes. Co um, business finds that money opportunity. It always does. Uh, fortunately for us, I just been first to market really, really quickly. But it, what I learned is you never want to be first, first, because yeah, yeah. I've first first both of them and I never become the, the biggest. And studies and history will show you that it's always the second, third, fourth that come out. They're just better organized, better monetized, better managed. And those individuals are the ones that build a brand that's second to none. Yeah, I love that you said that. And that reminds me of, and Vince McMahon stole this from somebody when the WWF was rolling and Ken Shamrock was in it. They asked him, what's the best advice or what's the best thing? And he said, innovate faster than the others can imitate. And I think that's an absolutely essential thing for the second thing. So if you're going to be first, you do all the pain. And now that there's a path, you're going to be second. Now what you have to do is make sure your product is way better yeah. than everybody else. And then you have to reevaluate, 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 tweak it. And so you're always innovating. Um, and 
that's why I'm excited about your management team. That's yeah, why I'm yeah. excited about you doing. Because if you can make what I see with bare knuckle now, that's kind of cool. That I'm like, oh man. They, Wait until you know, Jeff. I can't. I wish I could share it with you. Our when you see our first promotion, it's is it'd be like some, nothing you've seen before. It it doesn't look, feel, or smell like anything you've seen yet, and it's done in such a professional manner. When you see it, you'll be like. Oh, this is bare knuckle. This is where we're heading into the future, and it and it feels good. So uh, we're ex yeah, pretty pretty excited about it. It's interesting. Um, I'm probably you got you guys are probably keeping Dana White and Scott Coker up uh, late at night. Uh, I was talking with I was chatting with Coker not too long ago. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's all good. Yeah, I haven't been in touch with Dana, but um, you know, other than a few texts that we had not too long ago that. Yeah, it's funny story. For, so, well, man, I, I wish you the best of luck, and I'm excited to see where you guys are going. And I'm happy you took the time tonight to have this conversation with me. Um, if you look at global expansion into Canada, feel free to give me a shout. Um, but before we go, just a couple other things because I just want to know a little bit more about you and uh and uh, other people that just love your passion your visionary the stuff you've gone through with your life two questions one would be what would be a book that you would give away and what's the best advice you've ever received mm. <laughs> you should have prepped me with those <clears throat> <All right. laughs> yeah. um yeah uh, it's funny i brought up the book rich dad poor dad but if if you think that there's more to life there's a book called rich dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Yep. That is perfect for a lot of people. I think that's I still love the, the toothpaste into penny story. Yeah. Book, right? Like that is amazing. That is, isn't it? Well, that's that's like selling golf balls on the you know, the in the creek or however you might have made money yeah. in the day. That's a great book. Uh, spiritually Bible that keeps that keeps a person grounded. But yeah, uh, best advice that I have been given. Um, <laughs> there, Dalio, and he Ray, <laughs> he, Ray. So he and I, I can't. He didn't. He wasn't. He didn't give it to me directly. Um, so I'm stealing it. But he gave this advice, and it was in a book, and it had to do with hiring, and. And sometimes you, when you hire and you bring in people and you put people on the team, you, th you think they're going to be rock stars and they're just not, but you know, they, they had the gift of gab and you, and you really had the best of hope for them. But, he, but, but here it is. Find a person who doesn't need to be micromanaged. They do not need to be managed. Second, that whatever task you give him or her, they will die trying. They never give up. Ken Shamrock says the how he finds the the people that were going to come into the lion's den was he'd bring him in and bring him through the meat grinder, the gauntlet, and, and for one purpose to find people to give up. All he was looking for is for people to give up so he could shoot them out the door. That's what Vernon White did. That's what uh, Guy did. That's what all the Lions did. They looked for individuals that came through the program. But but Vernon, Guy, Pete Williams, Bolander, all those guys, all those guys had to go through the meat grinder. And those guys never gave up. And they became world champions. So there's a lot to be said about that. I met Vernon Tiger White in Vegas way back in the day. Uh, I was awesome. Uh, that's great advice. And um, and it, it, I love it. I mean, of the 28 episodes we've done, Fighters, Coaches, and Fathers, and I always ask people, you know, what's the story of success or the greatest advice someone's given you? It all came back down. It, and all, I wish there was different advice. I wish I could do more episodes. It's always hard work. <laughs> and who works through their pain and always shows up no matter what happens. And I'm like, I my seasons are done now. I can't get any more. Yours is a little bit different. So I love it. And Ray Dalio, just so anybody doesn't know, is one of the best uh, traders in, uh, in the world and has his own fund in New York and is amazing at finding the right people. But he's um, the thing that I love about him is that he is so transparent 
in his whole group, they basically say, I'm going to show you me naked and I'm going to show you the greatness of me and the garbage of me. And we're going to get through and we're going to be punishing to each other. Yeah. But our team is family. Right. And, uh, but you're going to be honest with me or you can't be here. So right. it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I love the fact that you brought him up. I love the fact that, uh, I love the fact you knew it was Ray. <laughs> That yeah. was impressive. <laughs> Thank hey, you. The book, the book principles. Read that book. You will love it. Love it. Love it. Well, he's on my LinkedIn, and I'm basically reading it every day because oh. I put every life skill gotcha. out there, right? Yeah. And uh, and you just keep sitting there. But when you realize how difficult it is to get to that level of transparency, mm. but when you're there everything gets easier because you mm -hmm. can't get secrets anymore like it's like what like yeah and uh and that is something that uh is really important in this day and age especially as market coaches and uh for the stock market and, and in finance but uh i'm super excited to see where valor goes i'm super excited about the management team and, and the announcements that come out if you guys are are looking to do uh canadian stuff feel free to reach out i don't know how i could be involved but uh, if you ever need somebody i'm here for you my friend but uh thank you so much for taking the time des and i wish you the best of luck appreciate that valorbk.com valorbk.com thank you my friend bye for now thanks jeff pleasure